Welcome students and alumni to our Careers Going Forward alumni panel event. My name is Marcia Gonzaga, and I am the Assistant Director of Career Services and Alumni Relations for the College of Global Futures. The purpose for the Careers Going Forward series is for us to engage and learn from industry leaders and career experts with the goal that these events will address what students can do with their career after graduation, as well as engage alumni, faculty, and staff with current business practices. I also wanna share that next month's Careers Going Forward um, series will be in collaboration with Earth Month, where we'll host a session with career consultant, Shannon Hu, as she discusses how to build a career that makes a difference in the world. There will also be a giveaway of our new book that just published last month. And I just dropped the link to next week's event in the chat. So to all of you at home or wherever you may be, we truly appreciate your time and attention as you join us in this virtual environment. And during this hour, there will be a handful of predetermined questions that the alumni panel will answer with the remaining time to address questions that you and the audience can add to the Q&A. With that being said, I would like to introduce my fellow moderator, Allison Gray. Allison recently joined the College of Global Futures as the Alumni Relations and Events Coordinator Senior. If you're an alumnus and wanna make sure that you're included in alumni specific communication, please email Allison at cgfalumni at asu.edu and she'll be introducing each of our panelists. Take it away, Allison. Thank you, Marsha, and a huge thanks to the College of Global Futures for facilitating this virtual event during these extraordinary times. The College of Global Futures includes the School of Sustainability, the School for the Future of Innovation and Society, and the School of Complex Adaptive Systems, and I'm excited that each of the schools are represented in the panel today. Today, we have an excellent group of ASU alumni. They've been able to apply their skills and knowledge to enhance the environment, while educating and collaborating with business, stakeholders, and communities to create impactful outcomes. So I'm gonna go ahead and we'll start introducing our panelists. So first off, please join me in welcoming our first panelist, Chris Fenwick. Of our alumni panel, he is our most recent graduate from the School of Sustainability. He is a Philadelphia native, currently residing in the Atlanta area. A husband and father of one, Chris served in the Air Force Reserve as a bioenvironmental engineering officer for nine years. He graduated from Drexel University in 2005 which with a bachelor's in environmental engineering. Chris has worked in a variety of industrial manufacturing settings on appliance, EHS management systems, and sustainability. Chris graduated from the Executive Masters of Sustainability Leadership Program in 2019 and will be starting a new position as the Senior Manager for Global EMS and Sustainability at Griffith Foods beginning Monday. So welcome, Chris. Next, we have Nitsa Hamidi. Um, please welcome her. She is a twice decorated ASU alumnus. She received her undergraduate in biomedical engineering and her master's in science and technology policy. She also earned her master's at Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. Her current role is an associate director of growth at Ginkgo Bioworks, a leading biotech company based in Boston, focused on making biology easier to engineer using synthetic biology. Her previous roles have been at Schmidt Futures, a venture philanthropy supporting interdisciplinary work in technology and society for a social good, the Federation of American Scientists, a science policy think tank, think tank, and IBM Watson Health at the intersection of healthcare and technology. Next, we have Isla Kaiser, who is one of the world's first biomimicry practitioners hired by a multinational corporation to develop biomimetic consum consumer products. As a senior scientist in biomimicry at Johnson & Johnson Consumer Health, she solves challenges in, her, in consumer healthcare by searching for solutions in nature. Isla continues to support ASU by serving as a mentor for the Fraser Global Mentorship Program. Like Nika, Isla also received two degrees from ASU, her doctorate in environmental engineering, and then returned to ASU to complete her Master of Science in Biomimicry. Isla is joining us from Normandy, France today. And finally, I would like to welcome Sean McGrath. Sean completed his bachelor's from the School of Sustainability in 2011. He founded Four Energy in 2010 while finishing up his schooling. Since then, Four Energy has made the Inc. 5000 list of fastest growing private companies in the nation three times, two qualified remodeler top 500 awards, and three Sun Devil 100 awards for growth. Sean is active in the community. He sits on the Global Resolve Board at ASU, is the current president of the Phoenix 20 to 30 Club and is next in line for the president of the Children in Need Foundation. 
So thank you to each of our panelists for joining us today. As Marcia, Marcia mentioned, during this hour, there will be a handful of predetermined questions that the alumni panel will answer with the remaining time to address questions that you and the audience can add to the chat or the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And I'll toss it back to Marcia to get the panel started. You're muted, Marcia. Every time. <laughs> Thank you. So um, we're going to start uh, by asking this question to all the panelists, um, and it's kind of two parts. How do you explain your work to a lay audience, and what aspect of your career do you find the most rewarding? And we're going to start off with Chris. Hello, everyone. And uh, this is something I have uh, yet to master um, as, as long as I've been doing it. Uh, but uh, I, I typically say I work in sustainability, and uh, for many people, they, they, they recognize the, the term, uh, and, and they think go green, and, and I say, yeah, that, that's part of it. I help uh, businesses or organizations you know, identify and understand their impact on their environment, their communities, you know, uh, looking, you know, down there. Uh, value chain to the raw materials on the other way to the to the final products understanding what the impact uh, of all of those processes and materials is on on uh, the environment and communities in which they operate now help them understand uh, the risk associated with that as well as the value in taking certain steps to reduce uh, or, or, or mitigate that impact and uh, the the best part of the of the uh, the whole process and, and my role is is telling those stories and 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 and, and pointing out and, and building value and the and the positive things we've we've done uh, value to the communities value to the shareholders value to the customers that are that are buying our product uh, and so that that's what's uh, most exciting about the the work I do. Thank you, Chris. All right, Nikta. Hi there. So again, I also struggle with answering this question. Uh, they will say if you can explain it to your parents you're doing something right, and I've yet to master that. Um, but Ginkgo Bioworks, apart from being a mouthful, is a leading biotech firm based here in Boston. We're one of the largest synthetic biology companies um, out there today. And what we do in a nutshell is we use the most advanced technology on the planet, which is biology, to grow better products. And our goal is using our platform to make biology easier to engineer. Um, this has been across, uh, you know, our platform has worked across the growth of biotechnology in many diverse markets. So from food to fragrance to pharmaceuticals, um, there's some really great collaborations we've done in, in almost every industry, but what I'm really excited about is in the last year, Ginkgo has uh, committed a substantial amount of their resources to support COVID-19 response and building long-term biosecurity infrastructure, um, which is where my role fits in. Uh, so what I end up doing is I work formally with policy and partnerships. So thinking about biosecurity and what that term even means now, let alone post pandemic and how being a leading biotech firm fits into the bigger picture um, to better you know, enable biology to protect society from future pandemics and biological threats. Uh, that is also what I find really rewarding is being able to connect partnerships, which is uh, you know, relationship building with policy, strategic thinking. And then of course the science itself is so cool. Um, I still find the work I can go exciting every single day. Um, and I made the decision to join in the middle of the pandemic and leave my previous role. So it was definitely something I was extremely um, motivated to do. Um, I wanted to be a part of the, the response efforts they were working on and, and the great contributions I think they're making. So finding a role where I can combine all of those different aspects of my background and my interests has been extremely rewarding. Wow, what an exciting challenge. Um, yeah. I love Hi everyone. So usually when I tell people I work in biomimicry, they kind of look at me and go like, bio what? So I have to explain what biomimicry is. And I usually do that with some examples. And like a classic one is 
if you've ever used Velcro, you're using a technology that was developed through biomimicry. So biomimicry is essentially trying to solve human challenges by looking for solutions in nature. And it's more than just taking something from nature. It's actually learning how nature accomplishes a function and then trying to emulate the mechanisms that nature uses to do something. So in my own particular work, I worked for Johnson & Johnson Consumer Health. So I've been tasked with designing or developing consumer products that are healthcare related. So topical creams or over-the-counter products, things like this based on biomimicry. So I can't go into the details of what I actually work on, but I'll give you one example that I'm not working on just to, to make it a little bit more clear. So sunscreen, that's a common consumer product. And if we wanted to try to develop a new type of sunscreen through biomimicry, we would start by asking the question, how does nature prevent or protect biological tissues, organisms from ultraviolet radiation, and then do a deep dive into the research, talking with biologists, um, looking in the literature to see how nature protects um, organisms from sunlight, and then trying to understand how that happens, and then translate that into a, some type of consumer product, sunscreen or otherwise. And what I really love about my job is that I feel so much more connected to nature after having learned about biomimicry and practicing it on a daily basis at work. It's been very humbling thinking that, well, humans maybe don't have the answers to everything or there's something that we can look at beyond just what we ourselves have designed and look at the millions of organisms that surround us and that have been on this earth for much longer than we have. So that's been really enriching for me. And then of course, biomimicry it also really I think it just lends itself to, to creativity, to being able to solve challenges faster because they already exist in nature. So if we can just take what already exists and try to emulate that from nature instead of starting from scratch, great. And it's very um, interdisciplinary. So you end up working with people from lots of different backgrounds, which is really cool. Thank you, Isla. Sean? Yeah, hi everybody. So my job seems a little bit easier to describe than, than some of these others. So I own and operate a company called Four Energy. Uh, we've been in business for 11 years. We're headquartered a couple miles west of ASU on the, uh, in Phoenix. So we are a full service construction company that purely focuses on energy efficiency and renewables. So we help homeowners in Arizona, Nevada, New Jersey, and Florida. They're all solar friendly states. That's why it, it's pretty random. We help them be more comfortable in their homes, reduce their, their carbon footprint through energy efficiency. And then once we do that, we suggest creating their own power through renewables, solar. So um, my kind of uh, most rewarding part of my career choice is kind of threefold. So I love making people more comfortable in their home. I love saving people money and all of those kinds of things. Um, but the second, and this is kind of a big one for us, we're a, we're a people first organization. So we find a lot of satisfaction in helping people really develop their skills in the, in the, in the career within our business and really kind of bring out the best in them and allow them to kind of level up. And then the third thing is owning a business. It's, it's got its highs and lows, but I really love that we're able to create and implement and do things that will either succeed or fail. The results are completely on us. And there's just a lot of satisfaction in that. That's great to hear, Sean. And I just love hearing just the range of impact each of you have, not only locally, but also globally. It's very impressive. Okay, so um, the next question for the group is what do you wish you would have known when you were a student that you know now in your career? And we'll start off with Nita. Oh, unmute. There you go. There you go. Um, yeah, so one thing I wish I'd known when I was in my career, and this might be really broad advice, but I have learned to get obsessed with whatever I'm working on. Um, not just reading things and learning things in theory, 
but really understanding them in practice and networking and absorbing all you can. Um, I mentioned that right now I'm working substantially in like the biosecurity space, which is a con constantly evolving term in industry. And to do so, you know, it just took a few weeks of reframing my mindset and you know, signing up for every Zoom webinar and newsletter, uh, setting up Google alerts, setting up one-on-ones with people who are maybe even in my secondary network and I don't know directly um, to, to keep myself on top of things. Um, one thing I've learned is like there's, it's very easy to succeed in most roles with a baseline amount of knowledge, but to get from that, um, you know, doing well versus doing really great it takes a lot of immersion into fields and fields and the areas that you work in can be constantly changing. Um, so pick things that you're excited about and then, you know, embrace them wholeheartedly and, and go in as much as you can. I'm amazed at like the power of LinkedIn and social media and everything else online, um, the amount of access you can have to, to things. I still reach out to professors from SFIS um, all the time and get papers sent to me that are behind pay paywalls and whatnot. And um, I wish I had been doing that since I was 17, 18 years old, starting at ASU. That would have probably allowed me to generate exponentially uh, larger wealth of knowledge. That's great advice. So take heart, <laughs> students, listen to that one. <laughs> um, Myla. Uh, for me, I guess I can build off of what Lisa was saying talking about going from theory to practice. I think in school, we do a lot of homework problems on paper, um, some class projects and such. But I think what I really wish I had done more of was thinking about how can I take, like for a class project, how could I take this and make it into a prototype, something real that could, I could actually test? Even if I didn't actually do that, because of course, as students, we have so much stuff to do and, and not much time, but but just doing the exercise of thinking, okay, how could I make this design? I'm especially talking to biomimicry students who are who are out there in classes. We, you know, try to solve a problem and design something on paper that's inspired by nature. But then taking the next step of thinking, okay, how would I actually turn this into something physical, a tangible prototype, and test it? I think going through that exercise of thinking about, oh, what materials could I possibly use? How much would it cost? It really gets you more in the framework of, or the frame of mind of what happens in, in business. Um, and I think that is really important to go beyond just theory and try to go into practice and prototyping if possible. And then another part is communication. And this is something I'm really finding working in a company and especially a large company like Johnson & Johnson. Communication skills are really important, but more specifically, if you're presenting an idea or just some type of concept research that you've done, even trying to make it as visual as possible is really important. Instead of just having a PowerPoint slide with, you know, some bits and pieces of facts, trying to present something visual, or if you've made a prototype, making a video of it, sharing that, seeing is believing. So, so that type of visual communication, I think, is becoming really important. Absolutely. I think we're always in a state of research and development. So, <laughs> okay, Sean. Yes. So my answer to this question would be, be a student for life. And what I, what I mean by that is when I was at ASU, especially towards the end of, of my education, I was really excited to get in the real world. I graduated, I started my business, things were great. I was very focused on that, but I kind of lost sight of, of, continuing education. So whether it's, you know, watching a, a YouTube channel on something that you're passionate about or something career oriented or reading, reading business books or whatever your specialty is, continue to educate yourself because, you know, when you, when you stop doing that, I feel you're, you're swimming or you're sinking and continued education is extremely important to stay sharp, to advance in your career, to continue to be creative, all of those kinds of things. So be a student for life. Absolutely. I love it. Um, okay, Chris. So for me, I think it would be the importance of uh, 
relationship building and understanding who you're working with, especially in, 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 my, in my career field. It's very important, you know, you, you have a message, you have something you're trying to do. It may seem very obvious that we should be doing this, but there's always a competing priority that you have to understand. So uh, understand influence, understand how to talk to people, how to understand what's important to them. Um, listen, listen a lot. And once you and once you do that, you start to build these relationships, and you can tailor your message to to meet the the needs of of that you know whoever that stakeholder is that you're that you're trying to influence. Um, so that that's certainly one thing I wish I would have had more opportunity to to practice uh, when I was in school uh, that I I use all the time now. Absolutely, and I I think not only in life but definitely business we have stakeholders at all different le levels so it's not it's best to just align with your buyer if you will um sound advice chris okay so this question again is for everyone and we'll start off with isla what are the best platforms to network or useful organizations to get involved oh and i have to admit this is probably my weak spot i'm not the best person at networking or using digital platforms, especially. Um, so I just want to put that out there that that's something I'm still working on. But for me, it's been um, trying to stay in touch with my peers, like through the biomimicry program that, that I was in, and we have like a Slack channel. But again, working on that. <laughs> and then, of course, there's LinkedIn as well to connect with people. Um, I try to be involved or keep up with the work of organizations that are relevant to biomimicry, since that's my field. And I do that by keeping up with the biomimicry organizations in the US, like the Biomimicry Institute and Biomimicry 3.8, but also in other parts of the world, especially now that I'm living and working in Europe, in France in particular, there's a French biomimicry organization that I'm involved with, and then in some of the surrounding countries in, in Europe. Um, and then I also, this is kind of <laughs> just a random thing. I, I have my own website that basically serves as a CV and I have a contact form. And I was actually quite surprised that that has served as a tool for connecting with people. People have somehow found me, Googled some terms or whatever, and then contacted me through the form. So that could be another way to, to just put yourself out there. And your search op optimization is actually on point. I think that's the first thing that comes up whenever you Google Isla Kaiser is your, your own website. So, <laughs> okay, so Sean. I think the answer to this is, is really specific to what people do, what career path they choose. So in, in terms of what I do, as far as networking is, and I think this is a possibility for everybody, stay involved with the university. So ASU has great alumni organizations and other groups for people that have graduated that allow you to speak to peers, people that you have things in common with. Um, I'm also involved in trade organizations, which, you know, I may be in a room with some competitors, some people with similar businesses, but it allows for best practices and, and good connections. And those are usually good things as well. And then the third to me is I get involved in charity groups. And those are, those are great for a lot of reasons. The work we do is amazing, but usually you find yourself with a, a peer group of people that are volunteering their time outside of their professional workplace to do other work in the community. And the connections you make with that type and caliber of person, it, it really pays off. I mean, you, you make good business relationships, good friendships, and it's, it's a really fantastic place to network. Definitely. And I, I will make sure to put this in the chat. Um, there's also just a general green chamber of commerce within the state of Arizona. So if you're local to Arizona and you're interested in organizations that are connected to that, I'll make sure to put the Arizona Green Chamber of Commerce link in the chat here in a minute. Um, next person, uh, Chris, I'm curious what has been very helpful for you. Uh, th this is something I'm just starting to get into myself uh but uh 
there's the sustainability leadership forum, which unfortunately isn't really for students uh, so much as it is for, for people working, but it's certainly an organization that uh, allows you to come together with businesses in the same area as you, same field as you uh, to help, you know, share best practices. And uh, that one has been exciting. There's no, if there's any number of uh, other organizations that will keep you informed with reports, you know, like business for social responsibility or uh, organizations like that, CDP, you can get that information as a, as a student. Um, but then I, I just challenge you, even though I didn't, I challenge you to start one. I mean, uh, get, get a group of like-minded people together and, and start, uh, start digging in. Yeah, that's great advice. I know that ASU has over a thousand student organizations. And if there isn't one, then create one. And that can just add to your leadership portfolio. So that's great advice. Nita, what have you found helpful for networking? Sure. Um, I'll probably just be consolidating everyone else's thoughts. So the first one being, uh, you know, the power of LinkedIn, I find phenomenal. Um, I add people all the time. And I think you mentioned that Isla is really easy to find. I also am really easy to find online just because I have a unique name. So make sure that, you know, your name pops up, is up to date, and you're easy to find on LinkedIn. Um, it's one of those great tools where it's seems like it's just an account, but I use a lot of the features there to figure out who might be at an organization uh, or who might know someone who knows someone who's at an organization that I want to work uh, work with or talk to or whatnot. And so I definitely like to keep that updated and make sure that I'm easy to find. Um, another thing is a little bit more methodical. I try to keep lists of every person I interact with who I think would be a meaningful conversation to have um, in the future. And so um, I'm not great at it, but you know, often if I have a job change, end of year, new year, things like that, I do try to like send out emails, just checking in. Um, and that list grows every year in the hundreds and hundreds, but it's a good way to quickly remember like, you know, I'd love to remember the other folks who are on this panel two, three years from now. And I'm sure my memory will not uh, retain that information for, for that long, uh, given all the Zoom calls we've had in the last year. So I try to be method method methodical about that and, and keep track. Um, and then the final point, uh, which was made earlier, just about always keep learning. I, I think um, always also stay involved. I, I think in, in college, it's so easy to find student organizations. ASU does a really good job at this. Um, I felt a huge gap after college where, what do you do? Like, how do grownups hang out um, outside of where they, you know, just with their friends. And I, I've, I've lived in four different cities since, since living in Arizona and I'm in Boston now. So uh, right now, the one organization I'm most involved with is called the Global Shapers. It's out of the World Economic Forum. And it's specifically meant for people in my age group that are done with their studies and not ready to maybe sit on the boards of organizations yet and we just get involved and half of the interactions they have there there's no overlap in industry but you learn so much just from sitting next to someone who might have founded a company in a totally different field or have other professional development skills that um, you know you may be lacking in great ideas Nita I really like the idea of just staying top of mind um, with you having connecting with people and having that list. So I can only imagine as you continue to move or grow in your position that that list will go get much longer. Okay, for the next question, this is actually specifically um, aimed at Isla and um, being that you know she's in bio biomimicry and the question is for an emerging field, do you have any suggestions to students on what to look for upon graduation? Yeah, upon graduation, um, I would say, well, even before graduating, going back to the, the networking, and it doesn't even have to be so broad, like through LinkedIn or anything, but having um, people around you, professors, mentors that know you, know what you're interested in and can support you. So for example, the job that I got at Johnson & Johnson was because my mentor, Dana Baumeister, sent me the advertisement for the position. And I applied for it and, and had the right background, so I got it. So 
that's really important to have people that are supporting you and can give you if they see something open up they can share those opportunities with you but then also as you're graduating thinking about first looking inside and thinking about now that you've gone through an entire program for the past four years or two years if you're in the master's program um thinking about from what you've learned what really pulled at your heartstrings so to speak what was really interesting to you what your strengths are and what needs are out there in the world that you can fill with your strengths and what you're interested in. So finding the overlap between your strengths, your interests, and the needs out in the world. So taking time actually to reflect on that before you jump out into the, the world and start just looking or grabbing for jobs. Um, so once you do that reflection, then thinking about, well, during my courses, in the areas that resonated with me, like who is actually working in that field and what type of work are they doing? Are these people that I can contact and, and make connections with? So kind of being proactive and connecting with people through LinkedIn or even just emails through finding them on, online in their department or what have you. But the tricky part with an emerging field is that sometimes there's not always tons of jobs out there um, that are open and waiting, environmentally included. So sometimes we actually have to create our own opportunities. And um, one, may, one way might be to start something yourself, start a business or, or some type of consulting work yourself. Another way might be to get a job that maybe isn't specifically in biomimicry or whatever other field that you're, you're working in at this moment, but that can teach you skills that you can then apply in the future in this area. And then also thinking about whatever job you're at, can you bring your passion, your interests to that job? So if, for example, with biomimicry, if you're in the master's program, for example, you have probably a bachelor's degree in some other field. In my case, I had a background in environmental engineering. And while I was still in environmental engineering, before I started working at Johnson & Johnson, I started talking with people in the department about biomimicry and, and how we could potentially use that in our work, our research work that we were doing at the time. So kind of bring it with you wherever you are. Try to apply the skills that you're, you're learning today that you have learned wherever you are. And you'll be surprised at how things can grow, what opportunities can come up. I think that's... Um good advice because I feel like that's more about establishing your brand but establishing your brand early and so that's what you're known for so you're sought out as that expert in the field if you will yeah yeah, yeah. and you can try to give presentations like lunch hour yeah. presentations about your field or go on to YouTube whatever try whatever you can do to to really talk about it and, and yeah you can get out there that's a great tip. And then if you have that video, post it on your LinkedIn profile. <laughs> okay, the next question is directed at Chris. What are some entry level ways to approach a department to establish a career that currently doesn't exist within that type of department? Okay, so first I'm going to say entry level senior director makes no difference you have to identify either you know an unmet need or even better a value uh, uh, that they're currently not taking advantage of and you have to be able to articulate that value in a way that reaches all the key stakeholders that are going to make the decision um, and I, I speak from a very industry, you know, manufacturing uh, centered uh, perspective. Uh, so please keep that context in mind. So I can give the example of when I, before I left my previous company, I was looking to create a, a new role uh, in the sustainability group around sustainable sourcing because we weren't doing it. We, you know, we were not evaluating our supply chain on uh, sustainability uh, issues. And the value uh, that, you know, 
I communicated was, you know, one, it's our, our customers are really big on this. You know, so if we can, if we can show that we're aligned, that's a differentiator between us and, and the next and our competitor. And it, and it also, you know, the, the other side of this is, is the risk. You know, if you're gonna, if, if you can identify a risk that is unmitigated, you know, and that's significant, that's also something that, that will help to uh, create, you know, this, this, this need or, or support for whatever role you are trying to, to create. Um, and I had a lot of momentum. And, and moving forward uh, on that role, then COVID happened and, uh, you know, everything went south. Um, but, but that's what I would do. I'd, I'd look at, you know, what is the business? What am I getting into? What's, you know, where, where is there an opportunity that they currently don't see? Or where is there a threat that they currently don't see? And how can I articulate it in a way that, that, shows them, hey, we need to make a change. We need this new position that's gonna help us uh, generate value at, on the, on the, in the best case and, and, and on the worst case, reduce risk <laughs> to the business. Because those are two issues that will resonate uh, with, a, with a senior leader. So that's how I would approach it. Thank you, Chris. It's almost like doing a SWOT analysis for her career. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. That's yeah. exactly. That's what I was imagining when you were saying those things. All right, Nikta, this question is specific to you. Following your bachelor's and master's degrees at ASU, what was your next move to secure a job? Absolutely, and um, I was really glad you asked me this. I uh, graduated from a public health degree and then followed by a science and tech policy degree here at ASU. Um, of course, really embedded in what was going on politically in the world and policy is deeply intertwined with basic, you know, whatever's going on in DC. And I was in the midst of my first job hunt during the same time as the 2016 election. And so it was a very um, nerve wracking time. And I made a very intentional decision to look outside of federal roles because they were so, you know, unpredictable at the time. So, uh, Advice number one, if that's what you want to do, don't graduate um, on an election year uh, if you can help it. But um, so I had to take a step back. And um, one thing that I did then, and it sounds more serendipitous now, but at the time was much more chaotic, was um, putting a lot of intentionality into job hunts. Um, at that time, I really had a list of like four to five things that I was solving for. And it sounds like a less exciting way to do it, but I realized early on that if you put your resumes on Monster and LinkedIn and all of these websites, you'll go, get calls from all around the board. And um, I know there's a lot of like sustainability students in this in this room or engineering students. And those are like buzzwords. If you've got that on your resume, you'll get calls for contract roles, short-term roles. And so I wanted to make sure I was making the decision and I ended up figuring out what I wanted. So I knew at that time I wanted to be somewhere with some stability, a larger company to give me room to move around. I was interested in traveling. So um, a consultant type role was ideal for me. I really just wanted to build skills um, and then narrow down the industry that I was interested in. My next job behind, um, I really just narrowed down to impact. I wanted to be somewhere making it an impact. And to me, that meant nonprofit or philanthropy world. And that's where I ended up. Um, and I wanted the work to be strategic and it, it was a huge risk. There were 10 people there when I started, but it was one of the coolest experiences getting to watch them grow over the last few years. And then, as I mentioned in this last job time, I wanted to be directly involved with COVID response, use my bioengineering degree and, and, and uh, policy background to, to good use. And so I think figuring out what those things are that you're looking for, you can apply to, it's always a good feeling when you apply and interview at dozens of places. And then you know the whole time just to validate like the one place you would have accepted. So I think I had one short list item on my short list, two, and then two for each job hunt that I've had. And that's made it a lot easier uh, to really understand what I'm looking for and what I want to do. Great. I can imagine those that are graduating on election year in the future and <laughs> gambling to try adjust their schedule. 
<laughs> yeah, I lost my whole network. I had just done a White House internship and all of those people were then out of a job by the time I was starting my role at IBM. And so, you know, it wasn't the worst thing in the world. People obviously have had crazy experiences in the last year too, but yes. whatever comes your way, it's, you know, a little extra preparation can go a long way. Absolutely. I agree. Um, okay. So this question is actually for Sean. And um, there's actually another part, I had a Q&A that kind of relates to this. So I wanna make sure to include this part of the question in the Q&A. Um, the first question was really any tips on starting a business? And I think part of that question comes from the Q&A. How did you decide to start a business so young and what kind of resources did you need? And what did that process look like in the early stages? Yeah, both really good questions. I love these questions. So mm -hmm. first, I grew up in a family where my dad had owned a small business in the state that I'm from in Michigan. So it was really natural for me seeing him work hard and work late and, and kind of build and develop a business when I was a kid. So that's kind of the path I always wanted to follow. And I always planned on moving back home and taking over the family business. But unfortunately, in 2007, he was forced to close it due to economic circumstances and things of that sort. So I was at ASU and I had this, oh my gosh, what am I going to do with my life moment? And I switched to the school of sustainability, started learning about solar. And at that point, I, I kind of just realized I could do the kind of construction work that he did, but do it in a more impactful way and something that I was, I was really passionate about. So I started when I was a senior at ASU and that led to a lot of failure, a lot of trial and error. Um, a lot of sacrifice. So leading into the other question of tips on starting a business, I would tell everybody that's considering it, really know and understand what you're getting into when you start a business. So a lot of people want to start a business or a company because they're good at something. And what they don't understand is when they start the business, they don't just have to be good at that one thing. They have to take on marketing and sales and doing the books and really, really understand all aspects of business. So a, a lot of people fail in the first couple of years of being in business. A lot of people fail within the first three and then a ton fail within the first five. So tips on starting a business. There's a phenomenal book that talks about this. It's called The E-Myth. And it, it really describes, I think the whole story is about somebody who makes and bakes pies and everybody loves their pies. They make amazing pies. So they started a business baking pies and the problem was they didn't understand all the other things that they had to do. So they no longer loved making pies because they associated with doing the books and doing the marketing and doing all these other things. So really understand what you're getting into. If you're, if you're wanting to start a business, I would absolutely suggest reading that book because it does a great job of describing it. And typically, unless you've got a lot of capital and you've got a lot of, of support in starting a business, um, get ready for some sacrifice and you've got to be resilient and persistent and you've, you know, you'll have highs and lows and you've just got to continue to press on as long as you possibly can. So um, there's been times, especially in the early days where I just wanted to quit and I am very, very happy and thankful I didn't. Um, but it's fun. At the end of the day, if you can accept owning your own results, whether they're good or bad, you're probably wired to, to own a business one day. And it's extremely satisfying once you get over kind of those, those initial hurdles. Thank you, Sean. And I made sure, I don't know if this is the most recent version of the book, but I made sure to drop a link um, of the email book that you were, you're mentioning. I tried to Google it really quickly. So again, I just put what was the first one. There might be an, a, an updated version, but for everybody to check out if you want to. Um, okay, so this next question is for everybody, and it might just be a really quick one because you might just think of one person or one class, um, but who were influential people in our class and your um, and I think I might have uh, missed a word, but oh, that were influential in your class um, in your academic and career trajectories. Who were influential? I will start off with Chris. Who were influential people in our class? So uh, definitely the, the class on storytelling uh, was uh, very, very influential for me. So now every, every pitch, everything I try to sell to somebody comes with a story behind it, as opposed to, hey, it will do this, so you should buy it. <laughs> 
no, now I've got to set the stage and, and, and you know, and get them, you know, get a hold of them uh, to, to, to communicate the value. So that's definitely the class that, that, that sticks with me. Also, um, I had a boss, my, my two bosses ago, that um, he, he taught me how to listen. I mean, he, he really uh, showed me the value and listening and relationship building within your organization. Um, and, uh, and it's, it's one thing that I, I rely on so much to be the, you know, and, and to be seen as the person who's, who will, uh, won't try to speak over you, who doesn't think they've already got it figured out, but wants to work with you and the team you know, to really come to, to, to solid solutions that have everybody's um, support. So those are, those are uh, uh, my two. Thank you, Chris. Nikta. Mine's quick and I'll throw in a plug. So Andrew Maynard uh, is a wonderful professor I've kept up with to this day. And he also, um, his book, one of his books came out during the pandemic. So if you don't get to meet him, can find his book and read all about it but I think he's just a really unique thinker and enthusiastic and knows how to you know excite an entire room of people about things that they might not think about otherwise I agree he has a great presence yeah Isla uh, for me I can point my finger at a class at ASU that I took during my master's program environment three and it was BMY 502 which is life's principles and it was really, for me, a, a foundational course to think about how nature works at, at, in more of a general sense as a framework, because life principles is a collection of characteristics that are common to almost all species. So they're really deep patterns that have been observed in nature. And I've been applying what I've learned in that course to my own personal life, but also I've, I've brought those learnings and thinking about these patterns in nature to my current job at Johnson & Johnson, using it for both designing um, products, evaluating existing products, and also thinking about sustainability and how can we create products or brands that are more sustainable thinking in terms of life's principles. Thank you. I like that you even put the subject <laughs> um, of the, the, the course code in there. So. <laughs> Thank you for that. that. It makes it easier. <laughs> sure. BMY 502, everyone. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for me, when I was within the School of Sustainability, I, I loved everything. I, I thought it was a it, it was a newer program at the time, but I, I learned about the Gro Global Resolve program, which I'm, I'm still involved with to this day, but that gave me the opportunity to spend a couple semesters working on a project um, the whole program is designed to work on a project and then actually take it to another nation and actually start a business. So uh, the influential person to me was Mark Henderson. And we spent two semesters developing a, a clean cooking fuel that we could go and implement in, in Ghana, Africa. And then my, th my third semester in the program, we went to Ghana and we tried to start a business. And it was, it was extremely hands-on. It was, it, it gave me a lot of good life experience, but most of all, it really solidified my desire to be in an industry and own a company that can be impactful to everybody that we work with. Great, that's amazing. Um, and hopefully soon we'll be able to have study abroad opportunities such as that, um, that's the goal. Okay, so um, if you do have a question, make sure to drop it in the Q&A and we'll try to address it because we still have about 10 minutes left, but we do have one more slide um, for everyone to um, answer. What advice have you received or given that was most impactful to your career success? And we'll start off with Isla. Oh gosh, this question is really tough to narrow down to just one, the most impactful. Um, so I'm, I want to give a couple of pieces of advice that I have received or given that are foundational and then more career specific. More foundational advice would be to prioritize your physical, mental, emotional health. 
um, especially when you're working in, in, in an emerging field, there can be quite a bit of pressure to do really well to try to like push that field forward or, or, or serve as an example of someone in, in working in that field that's successful. And I felt that pressure and, and sometimes I worked way too many hours or too late into the day um, and it took a lot of energy. So then I had to remind myself to prioritize my own health and well-being. Um, a book by Cal Newport called Deep Work was really helpful for me with, with trying to really focus and go deeper into my, my job. And it's all about trying to improve your focus in a world that's very distracting, including smartphones and everything else. So I highly recommend that book. And then with more specific to a career, um, first going into any job, expect that there are gonna be obstacles. Um, if you go in expecting that you're gonna face challenges, you won't be as deflated or disappointed. You'll, you'll have the energy to face them. Find champions in your job, people who support you and believe in the work that you're doing and can connect you with, with people who can help you get what you need, whether it's resources, um, expert knowledge from somewhere else, what have you. And then finally, when you're first starting in a new job, it's good to diverge a little bit and like look at many different areas that you could work on. So for example, with me at Johnson & Johnson, when I first started, I had a lot of different projects that I got involved with because I was excited. I wanted to share biomimicry with as many people as I could. But at some point, you're, I, I found I was spreading myself too thin. So I had to really focus on the one or two projects that would have the most potential to succeed. So do a little bit of di diverging to get a feel for things, especially in a new job, but then really converge and focus on something that you can drive forward. Thank you. I, I like the brief, uh, how you said find champions. I always say find advocates, but I, I think champions sounds even better. Oh, um, advocates are good. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Sean? Yeah, kind of similar. So to me, the most important thing that, that advice that was given to me was surround yourself with people that support you. So surround yourself with people that are a positive influence and, and can help you and motivate you and support you in, in whatever career path you choose. So people, I believe in this, people are very similar to the people that they're around the most. So to me, if you're around people that can continue to educate you and have good creative conversations with you, um, it, it really elevates you in your career path and, and just where you are in life. So surround yourself with good, solid people. Great. That's awesome. I think it's like the top five people you surround yourself around or it's something like that. So, um, Chris, what advice? I already said, listen, I mean, just listen to people. Um, it goes a long way. And the other side of that is, you know, close the loop. Uh, if I'm asking for, for things, uh, especially in, in, in my field, I'm asking a lot of plant managers and purchasing people and site people for, for information and things. And, and uh, I, I like to make sure I close that loop so I communicate why, so they understand the reasons why I'm working on what I'm working for, what's, import, what's important about it. Uh, and then you know, the outcome, this is, this is the value that your information uh, created for me. Um, so thank you, you know, and saying thank you <laughs> for that. And the, and the last piece, I'd say, uh, you know, read what got you here won't get you there. Um, it, it, it's a great uh, book about uh, the behaviors of successful people. And, and <laughs> it, it taught me a lot about myself and it, and it, and it articulated things I have seen in, 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 in leaders that I thought they could work on. Um, so it, it's a great, uh, it's a great book to uh, learn about how to, to uh, have the, those, those behaviors that will make you a successful leader to, to keep you moving up. Thank you so much. I'm loving all the book recommendations. I'm quickly trying to Google them and put them in the, in the chat really quick so everybody can check those out. Um, Nikta. Um, I feel like I have to give something good since this might be the last answer of the day. Um, 
uh, a few pieces of advice. So one that I received from a former manager was always know your audience and work backwards from that. And I think that applies to everything. So whether you're speaking in a meeting or starting a business, I really liked the pie example, but like if you're making pies, you better know who you're making them for, how the world will change and like what you need to do to get there. And I tried to think about that in like uh, the very small level from meetings to job changes to you know what I've studied and, and everything in between um and then the other thing is I try to so I like I'm an engineer but I've worked around a lot of like policy folks lawyers and MBAs and I it reminds me every day what my gaps are and I think that's actually been a great experience so if I had an MBA I would surround myself with people with tech degrees and if I um you know had a degree in sustainability I would surround myself with people with maybe business degrees and like really just see what you can absorb and what you can't uh everyone's sharing their book recommendations but like read all the management self-help how to make yourself better communicate more effectively I don't think I did this in college and I realized that everyone in their like late 20s and 30s that's all they they read or listen to um but there's definitely some value there right um and you start figuring out patterns of why everyone that around you is successful is doing the same things and nobody can hand you that information. I think you just have to like jump in and read about it, talk about it, live around people with different skills than you have until you kind of get the hang of it yourself. Absolutely. And um, we'll go ahead and go into the Q&A. We only have like three minutes left. So there was um, a couple of things that I want to make mention um, in the Q&A. Um, that this is being recorded. Um, so I just want to give you a heads up that yes, um, today's workshop is being recorded and will be uploaded to the College of Global Futures YouTube channel and hopefully the next two weeks. So I went ahead and dropped the YouTube channel in the chat just in case. Um, the other thing that um, I'm curious to know if there's one podcast, because everybody's mentioning book, is there a podcast that you would recommend? And if you could name one, um, we'll go ahead and start with Sean. Is there one that you can recommend? I'm horrible at this question because I don't listen to podcasts. Oh, often. okay. <laughs> I have an Audible account. So when I'm driving, I'm, I'm typically listening to a, another business book or self-help book or something gotcha. along those lines. But sorry about the podcast. Not no, no, no worries. Anybody else have a mention of a podcast or want to mention a podcast that they would recommend? Chris? Uh Revisionist history, uh, Malcolm Gladwell. Okay. Um, just uh, the idea of understanding that how things were uh, explained to you that have happened in the past may not have happened exactly the way, uh, or you know, the intent behind them may not be what uh, you thought. Uh, things like that just that critical thinking uh, uh, skill has has enhanced for me in, in listening to to his uh, Malcolm Gladwell's podcast and all his books too, um, just for the record. Absolutely, absolutely. Nita, I think you, were you a muting for a podcast? I just dropped mine in the, in the oh, chat. Great. Thank you, I appreciate that. Awesome, and then Isla, did you have a podcast that you would recommend? Oh gosh, I haven't been listening to podcasts in quite some time because I'm okay. in France. I'm trying yeah. to learn French. So I've been oh, like, wow. okay, focused on like French podcasts or videos, stuff on YouTube. Um, in the past, I used to listen to like health and wellness types of podcasts just to remind myself to take care of myself in that way. Um, such good self-care. It really is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I'm definitely big on on that taking care taking the time to take care of oneself so that you can do your work better and, and be more focused have more energy etc oh, thank you so much yes i think it's especially in these times as we're starting to venture back out um to not necessarily normal i think it's important that we think we take care of ourselves first it's kind of that oxygen mask principle take care of yourself first so you can take care of others <laughs> um well today's um I want to make sure that um, I remind everyone to register for next Friday's Careers Going Forward event, if you're able to, um, and it will be with career consultant, impact sector expert, and author Shannon Hood. And so um, the link is in the chat in case you want to register for that. 
Um, last but not least, I just wanted to thank you, Chris, Nita, Isla, and Sean for your time and your willingness to share your career experience and expertise across the business spectrum. I loved the range. And on behalf of the College of Global Futures and the ASU com uh, community, I sincerely appreciate each of you for joining us today. And I wish all of you health and wellness. Thank you again and have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone.